This call is now being recorded. This is Global Tell Link. You have a prepaid call from Silas Johnson. An inmate at the Sentinella State Prison, Sentinella, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Tell Link. Thank you for calling me back. Okay. So I, I wanted to ask you, the first day, because because there, there's a con- controversy on, on, on YouTube where certain people say that black people in prison don't check paperwork. When, what was your experience when you got to, uh, as soon as you got to the yard, were you, were you required to show any paperwork showing why you were there? Oh, absolutely. I was required to show it to my celly and, and my older homie, the one I told you about, he, he came to the door and he checked it and basically verified to everyone else. And does that, does that apply to all, all the blacks? Or does does it uh, does it is it does it vary by by region or by by area? As far as you know, um, my primarily my experience has been you know with obviously with the the Bloods and and Crips of the Los Angeles and Greater Los Angeles region, um, and and my experience within within that you know circle is that you know. You, you come there, people need to know who you are. Who you are, where you came from, what you did, what are you here for, you know. Um, and as far as the Bay Area, uh, I've, I've seen, you know, from interacting with them on the yard, the same principles. So I don't know where, where anyone would get that no one's paperwork is being checked. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's false. That's patently false. What about the notion of other groups um, allowing to tell, or or it being okay to tell when when you're in the main line? Have you ever heard or seen seen anybody from other groups ever tell on somebody else, or hearing that heard, it's okay to tell? I have heard, I've heard in... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I've heard in the black community that that Southern Mexicans have given their comrades the okay to inform on, on, on black residents. Um, I've never heard that as far as blacks being able to to inform on, on anyone. I mean, if I've experienced, I mean, people from my old gang being on yards and and Southern Mexicans bringing paperwork saying, "Hey, look, this is this is your guy," and there was there was swift action taken, swift violent action taken. Um, so I don't, and and I would I would presume that on the other side. That's that. That's just you know. It's just a myth. I mean, I've never been on a yard where a black has brought some paperwork to any other race and saying, "Hey, you, you know, your your people, you know, the, your home was a rat, and the guy just stand on the yard." I've never seen that before, and I've been I've been around, been around. So I I, I would presume that that. The rumor amongst blacks are is about Southern Mexicans is a lie because I've never seen it. Thank you, thank you for for clear, uh, sh- shedding some light and and uh, giving us your your point of view or, or what you or what what you experienced. So, right before our last phone call cut off, uh, you mentioned that you had seen a few people get stabbed or, or murdered. Um, within your first few years being there, seeing something like that, what kind of toll does that have have on your on your on your mind or on your on your mental? Um, 
initially it's, it's shocking to your system. I mean, there, there's, there's, I mean, there's fear, there's anxiety, you know, about, you know, this could possibly happen to me. There's, there's, there's angst that goes along with it, you know, and, and seeing it for the first time, you know, you, you're empathetic. You feel for the individual that this happened to, you know, and I mean, all of those things are, are, are what goes along with the trauma of, of, of witnessing that for the first time. But eventually, you understand, and I don't even think it, it's consciously that I understood this at the time. And I think it's a it's just it's just a survival mechanism, you know. You compartmentalize it, and you put that so you put that stuff away, because if you internalize that, and and you are empathic in that manner, walking through life in prison. You won't make it mentally. You won't make it. You'll go crazy. You'll break down because it's happening so much every single day, every other day, that you you can't afford for your own mental and spiritual wealth, health, to to internalize that. You know, so so we have these mind Jedi mind tricks that we play. You know, hey, that dude owes some money for dope. You know, he knew the job was dangerous when he took it. He had that come in. You know, uh, hey, better him than me. He had bad paperwork. You know, he was a snitch, or you know, he he got out of line with the with the big homie. So hey, you know, that's you know that's what you get. You know, he knew the job was dangerous when he took it. You know, those are the consequences of the game. So all of these things are what we tell ourselves. You know, or he's another race. You know, hey, oh well, you know, he's another race. You know, he's a white boy. You know, they're others. They're Asians. You know, they're Mexicans. So it don't matter. You know. And all of those things are, are, are mechanisms that we use to, to use as an intentional barrier between us and our humanity. So we don't have to internalize those things and feel those things and, and, and experience that trauma habitually because no human being can stand up under that. That's deep right there. So how how long did you did you stay there in Salinas Valley before you you got transferred out to another prison or to Adseg? Uh, I was there from October two thousand two to February two thousand seven. Uh, I spent a year. I I had a uh, I caught my first stabbing up there in the day room of one of my coworkers. We were porters. And I spent a year in the ASSEC in the hole before finally being transferred to Tachapi Shoe to serve out the last six months of an 18 month shoot for a battery with the weapon and serious bodily injury. And what kind of, what, what would cause you to stab, stab another individual that you work with in prison? Um, we had, we had a, a disagreement it escalated to the point where he threatened me, and uh, we were separated by by a section door. And um, the tower had actually seen him get loud with me, and so uh, he had both of us uh, shower and go back to our cells. And uh, he was the regular, so we were critical workers because uh, the whites had stabbed the stabbed the CO there. So uh, the program was like limited. There were only like critical workers out where only essential workers. There's there's no regular yard, only the people, kitchen workers, porters, laundry, canteen, people who actually keep the yard running are allowed to come out. And um, so uh, they lock us down and a couple days go by and I can't get to them. And so finally a non-regular comes and makes the mistake of letting us out at the same time. And uh, he walks up and apologizes and I placate him and he goes to my cell door and as soon as he starts talking to my cell, he, you know, I, I attack him. And uh, and looking back, it was something that that I could have avoided. I didn't have to do, you know. But in my mind, once the threat was passed, now it's about, not only is it about public perception, if someone else finds out that this happened because I'm a gang member, it's also about me feeling and knowing that I have to spend the rest of my life in prison 
and in my mind, some power has been taken from me. So in order to restore the balance of power, and for me to be in power again, I need to enact some violence to get back something that was taken from me during this conversation. And so that's what I did. And, and once you stabbed him, how were you, how were you, how, how did you stop stabbing him? Or was it, did the, an officer show up? Did you get pepper sprayed? How, how did the, how well, did the incident I, I began, go? I, he was talking to my cellmate and my cellmate was inside the, the cell actually. And, uh, I had a bag on the floor and I asked him to take the bag over to B section to somebody. It was just a bag of deodorant, a prop that I used just to, you know, just to get him to lean down and pick it up. He picked it up and it's, he was coming up and, and I just laid into him and punched him. And when I punched him, he, he was out. He didn't feel anything. He, he fell, he hit his head, he fractured his skull in two places when he fell because he fell head first. And I, I drug him away from my cell, pulled off the knife and stabbed him four or five times and, and kicked him, punched him, and I mean, he he was just asleep the whole time. So I I was the one that actually just just stopped because, in truth, like when he fell and busted his head, like there was so much blood coming out of his head that I was actually alarmed because I didn't intend for that to happen. I intended to knock him out when I punched him, but to see that much blood, you know, it, and just it was just shocking to me so when I pulled him away from the door I drove him away it was just kind of like well this is happening I mean there's no sense in stopping now and so uh so yeah so I stabbed him five times and afterwards you know it was it was evident that he was unconscious and it you know there was no resistance whatsoever and and so I just stopped and um and eventually the floor officer saw he came in and asked me to get down, and so I just put the knife down, backed up, and, and got down and let him cuff me up, and and they brought the ambulance for him, and they life flighted him to a hospital in the area. And be, besides the time that you got in, in uh, ATSEG, were you, did you get new street charges? Say, say again? Uh, besides ending up, because you did an 18-month uh, shoot term, right? Or at an in, in ATSEG? Right. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Besides those 18 months, did you pick up street charges? No, I didn't. I, I was I was fortunate in the regard that they just, the DA never picked up anything. Monterey County never picked it up. And uh, I, think, I think it was because I mean, I had 24 to life, and back then, 24 to life might as well be, you know, five life without sentences. You know, the governor, even people that were fortunate enough to, to gain parole through BPH were having their dates snatched by the governor. So, you know, that the district attorneys, wherever you were, in whatever county in California, were, you know, if you were a lifer, they pretty much didn't care, you know, because they knew that you weren't going to get out anyway. And do you know what ended up happening to the individual after um, after he uh, got out of the hospital? Yeah, he actually came. I was in an accident in over in an accident overflow building on D Yard, and he actually came to the building in the section where I was at after he got out of the hospital uh, a few weeks later. And uh, they walked me to the shower because it's just cuff movement everywhere in the accident, and. Uh, I walked by his door, and uh, he told the COs that that I stabbed him, and they moved him out of the building. And by him so telling that was the, the last time I saw him. by him telling the COs that you have sixty seconds remaining, that you stabbed him. What would something like that do to his his uh, his career as a as a as an inmate? Or his prison oh, as a gang member, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's open. It's open. So from that point on, that was that was it. He pretty he checked he checked himself in, right? Exactly. Yeah. So 
he, he left the main line, so he was done after that.